something somewhat related, and it'll be Stephen's uh, uh, onus to say how the relation works out. Um, so Stephen, please dive right, right. in. Right. Well, thank you so much. Thanks to the organizers, uh, Marina and Rob and Murda and everybody who's attending and in my view, pushing cognitive science in, in, in an important new direction. Um, thanks, uh, Deborah, for a fascinating talk. Um, I guess, uh, in the sense, what I'll be doing is saying that um, I, I won't be talking about learning either, but I will be suggesting that people are a little like ants, um, differ in that we tell stories. And as far as I know, ants don't. Although I do wish that human beings were as successful as ants in many ways. Um, okay, let me see if I can share my slides. You got them? Yep. Okay, great. So I will be talking about the community of knowledge and outsourcing. Um, most of the discussion so far in this workshop has concerned small group behavior, and in particular, how organisms, mostly people, uh, I'll be talking exclusively about people, collaborate um, and sometimes compete in small groups. Um, my focus, uh, so, so that concerns for the most part how small groups um, perform tasks together. Um, and I am going to be changing the subject a little bit, talking about large groups like institutions and communities um, that also obviously rely on collaboration to a large degree and, you know, often competition as well. But the other thing they rely on um, is outsourcing, that is, individuals within large groups outsource problems, information collection, information retention to others. Now, of course, this happens within small groups too. Um, my sense uh, and my main hypothesis is that in large groups, this happens even when we don't know we're doing it. And, and that changes things a little bit. Um, so, you know, it's, I, I think it's really important to think about how large groups um, collaborate, um, make use of one another, uh, because this is what determines our identity, right? Um, our, our identities are based on our social worlds to a large degree. And this, of course, infiltrates how we behave in small groups as well. If you have small group members, all members of a, of a single identity group, then you're going to get certain kinds of interactions that differ from when you have people from who have diverse identities. And of course, it also determines how we should think about the formation of policy and social structures like governments and all kinds of really important things. So let's first think about this in terms of uh, COVID, something we're unfortunately all very familiar with. Um, my main interest here is how people form their opinions about, um, about COVID. And there are a couple of theories out there. One theory, what the, the theory that I think is predominant, um, often implicitly, um, is that people uh, assume their position on COVID, on COVID mitigation procedures, on the value of things like masks and social distancing and vaccines um, based on what they know and their understanding of things like how the coronavirus gets transmitted, right? So that kind of view I'm going to call the deficit view. Um, the idea being that if you want to straighten people out, all you have to do is shove the right knowledge into their heads. Um, the alternative view is that people take their position in a way that's relatively independent of knowledge. It's based only on what the people around them believe, that we're just channels for the beliefs of those around us, um, because if we don't channel those beliefs, 
then we become social pariahs. We get kicked out of the social group. So there's a really strong force um, causing us to espouse certain opinions, right? Imagine if I came around, if I came to this group and said something like, um, oh, vaccines uh, are a product of the devil. Um, you know, they, they're, they're full of, uh, of chips that are just, that, that are following us around, keeping track of our location. Um, you probably wouldn't pay much attention to the rest of what I have to say. I'd become a pariah in this group. So the first view, the deficit model, um, I really think is assumed generally by most scientists, not obviously by social psychologists for the most part, but by other scientists and by um, the citizens at large. So the deficit model is being assumed whenever we talk about information bubbles, as if what determines people's um, opinions is the information that they have access to. It's assumed by social network analysis because that assumes that we're passing messages back and forth and it's the information contained in the messages that governs our thinking. Um, it's assumed by the notion that we can change people's minds through information campaigns, obviously. And it's also assumed by the notion that the way to correct certain social problems like the fake news endemic is to teach people um, critical reasoning skills so that they know how to distinguish the wheat from the chaff. Right, so it's a it's a view that I think is central in most of um, social discourse. The alternative view uh, is sometimes referred to the cultural cognition view. That's a term that comes from Dan Kahan, but of course it's a view that is very old in social psychology. It, you know, we could trace it back to Sharif's uh, Robbers Cave experiments and Solomon Ash's work and probably long before that. Um, the basic idea is that many policy related judgments are made along community lines, right? And it's, it's our social identities which drive our opinions. So one example of this um, is some work that uh, I did at the beginning of the pandemic. So we surveyed a bunch of people in September of 2020 and found that the best predictor of COVID-19 preventive behaviors, policy support, right? Support for policies like whether we should have to socially distance and wear masks, um, and also people's attitudes about risk perception, the best predictor of all these things was their political ideology. So that shouldn't surprise anybody here, right? We know that Democrats and Republicans differ a lot on their attitudes towards COVID. The main point here really is that this was true even relatively early in the pandemic. Um, and in fact, um, a student of mine, Mae Fullerton, did her honors thesis where she tested people, she surveyed people in April of 2020, as well as October, and found even then that people's actual risk for COVID, like their age or any immunodeficiencies they had, um, and in fact, their perceived risk of COVID, neither of those things prevented their uh, willingness to socially distance and wear masks. Again, what predicted it was their partisanship. Um, so these are you know, straightforward examples of how our sense of identity is governing our attitudes because there was very little known actually about how the uh, virus was transmitted at the time. So, um, I don't want to give the impression that I'm a firm believer in the social identity thesis um, and completely dismiss the deficit model. In fact, the data are kind of mixed. So here's some work that I did with Nick Light and Phil Fernbach and Matt Rabb and Mugurgiana. And we took some politically sensitive issues, climate change, genetically modified foods, et cetera. And we gave people little tests um, on their general knowledge of these things. 
And what we found, and we also asked them what their attitude was. And the first thing that we found was that uh, the degree to which they opposed the scientific consensus, right, was negatively related to their scores on these general knowledge tests. In other words, the more they knew about these uh, issues, the more likely they were to agree with scientists, with scientists' conclusions. And the less they knew, the less likely they were to agree. So that's a little bit of evidence in favor of the deficit model, right? That knowledge is predictive to some degree of people's attitudes. But we also found when we asked people how much they thought they knew, right? What their subjective understanding was, we found just the opposite. So the more they thought they understood about these issues, uh, the more opposed they were to the scientific consensus. Um, and this was also true of the kind of COVID-19 attitudes and behaviors I was talking about earlier. So it's a robust effect that, that objective knowledge is negatively related to opposition to the scientific consensus, but subjective knowledge is positively related. Um, and in fact, uh, we explored the subjective knowledge effect a little more by seeing whether people would bet on their actual knowledge scores. So we asked them if they thought their uh, actual knowledge scores were above average and whether they were willing to bet on, on their belief. And, um, and we were clear that the actual knowledge scores we were talking about reflected factual information from top scientists at you know, standard um, academic places. Um, and what we found was that the more people thought they understood, the likelier, the more likely they were to be willing to bet on their knowledge, to be willing to bet that their knowledge corresponded to that of top scientists. Of course, by definition, the more, um, so what I'm plotting, the x-axis here is the degree of opposition to the scientific consensus. So the more they were opposed, the more they were willing to bet, um, the less likely they were to have an actual knowledge score above the average. And as a result, their payout was lowest for those who opposed the scientific consensus more. So the more they opposed the scientific consensus, the more willing they were to bet, um, and the worse they did in terms of getting the little bit of money that uh, we, we offered them. So, what I've shown you so far is that understanding does matter with regard to our attitudes and our willingness to buy into a scientific consensus, which does provide a little support for the deficit model, but our sense of understanding matters too. And it matters in the opposite way. So how well people think they understand science is not directly related to how well they do understand science. In our data, what I just showed you was a kind of negative relation between those two things. Um, and so I think this suggests that when we think about opinion formation, when we think about attitudes, we have to think about what's driving people's sense of their own understanding, and it's not just their actual understanding. What I believe is their sense of understanding comes to some degree from their communities. So each community that we're a part of buys into some narrative that introduces a kind of ideology, right? So we've, most of us here have bought into a narrative that says, um, you know, science should dominate and that there are certain um, kinds of methods that produce truth. Um, I've certainly bought into that narrative. Uh, whatever ideology you buy into is associated with certain sacred values, certain norms, um, and it produces a kind of illusion of understanding, as I've shown in other work. That, that is, it gives people a sense of understanding that they don't actually have. Um, so in that sense, I think people are like ants in that 
were individually kind of ignorant, but we gain a kind of intelligence by virtue of working with a community. So we live in and work with a community of knowledge. So the wrong way, I think, to think about at least large scale human interactions is in terms of pairwise interactions between people. We rather have to think about how the narratives that we live by are formed and how those narratives influence our actions and beliefs. Um, so one implication of this idea, I call the outsourcing hypothesis. So um, the, the hypothesis is that people use this very simple heuristic. It's kind of the most simplifying heuristic there is. When asked to make a difficult judgment, avoid it. You can avoid it by simply outsourcing the question to your community of knowledge. And um, I published a paper with Nat Rab in 2016, which provided some evidence, a little bit of evidence in favor of this hypothesis. So we think about it in terms of demonstrating a contagious sense of understanding. We gave people little vignettes, like in this case, um, DARPA, the, the US uh, Defense Research Agency, has published a May 2014 study about a newly discovered rock that the agency scientists have not yet explained. The rock is similar to calcite, yet it glows in the absence of a light source. The authors of the study do not understand how it works. They provided a description of the remarkable appearance of the mineral and outlined future experiments, and then some other uh, irrelevant stuff. And then the question we ask is, how well do you understand how glowing rocks work? And there's a kind of right answer here, right? The right answer is, I don't understand at all because I haven't told you anything about how glowing rocks work. And all I've said is that scientists don't understand how glowing rocks work. Okay, another condition, um, the public explain condition is exactly the same, except instead of saying scientists have not yet explained, we say scientists have thoroughly explained. And instead of saying the authors do not understand, we say the authors fully understand. And that's the only difference. And the question again is how well do you understand? So, you know, you might guess that our finding is that when scientists understand, people think they understand more than when scientists don't understand. Um, in other words, the scientist's understanding is kind or sense of understanding is contagious. People think they understand merely because of the scientists. It's like whenever I'm around Rod, I think I understand what he's talking about, right? Because I outsource my understanding to him. Now, one, one implication of the no, notion of a community of knowledge is that this effect should only occur when you can access the knowledge, right? If you can't access the knowledge, then it's not really in your community, right? So the idea here is not that people are crazy, that the, that the heuristic, the outsourcing heuristic is, is stupid. It's in fact necessary in order to survive, right? We can't retain everything as individuals. We have to rely on others, um, but we can only rely on others if we can access the knowledge. And so we had another condition where we said it was exactly the same as the scientists understand condition, except in this case, we say scientists understand, but the knowledge has been classified as secret. After all, the study was done by the Defense Research Agency and they have to maintain secrets, right? So now the scientists understand, but the knowledge is secret. And what we find is that there's a significant advantage of, uh, in terms of people's sense of understanding when the scientists do understand relative to when they don't. And that advantage disappears when the information is being held secret. So these are tiny effects, admittedly, but it's a very small manipulation, right? And, and things are probably very different when everyone around you thinks they understand something, even though perhaps nobody understands. So it's a small effect that's been replicated. In fact, I was surfing the web once and discovered that someone had gone out and replicated it and got exactly the same results. Um, okay, so, my last point is that you can bring this outsourcing heuristic to bear 
in order to improve citizens' reliance on evidence when they're making judgments. So let me spell that out a little bit. Um, a consensus conference, some of you might know a consensus conference as a deliberative poll. It's very closely related to what some people call a citizen's jury. And basically the idea is that you bring a bunch of a representative sample of the citizens of a country, a nation, a community together um, so that you have a variety of ages, genders, races, ethnicities, et cetera. And you do three things. So you take a bunch of issues and first you poll the people about their attitudes on these issues. Next, you give them a huge amount of information about it. So in, in well-known examples in Texas, people were given three days to learn about and discuss the various topics. So uh, information from, from a variety of perspectives is shown to the, to the individuals. Experts are introduced. You're allowed to ask questions of the experts. The, end of the people at the conference themselves are allowed to discuss. So they kind of become experts on the various issues that you're discussing. And then you pull them again and see if their minds have changed. Okay, so that's what a consensus conference is. And our question was, and this is work with Daniela Cooper and David Yoakum, um, are people willing to outsource to a consensus conference? In other words, can we basically scale up the effects of a consensus conference? Consensus conferences are very expensive to run, right? And you cannot take um, even a small country, never mind a country like the US, and get everyone uh, up to speed on all the policies that uh, are, alive, are alive at any given point in time, right? It's just too expensive and people wouldn't be interested anyway. They have other things to do, right? Um, so can we, can we scale up the effect of consensus conferences by seeing if individuals will outsource to them? In other words, will telling people the results of a consensus conference change their minds? So here's an example of what we did. Um, we went on to MTurk and took, uh, and first, um, told people what a consensus conference was. And what we told people was exactly what I just showed you. So they read this little description of the consensus conference. And then we took an issue. We said, currently the federal minimum wage is 7.25 per hour, though many states have minimum wage laws, blah, blah, blah. There's a proposal to raise federal minimum wage to $15 per hour. And then we asked them whether they were in favor of the proposal. Next, we told them what happened at, the, at an actual consensus conference regarding this proposal. So before the conference, 54% of participants supported the policy, but after the conference, after learning about it and deliberating, support dropped by 15% to 39%. And then again, we asked people whether they were in favor. So here are the data. We had four different issues. And the first column is how people at the actual consensus conference felt before the conference, then how they felt after the conference. And the last two columns are how our um, participants felt. Um, so before we told them what happened at the conference and after we told them what happened at the conference. And you can see that for three out of four issues, foreign aid being the counterexample, um, there was a drop that corresponded to uh, the, the change, I shouldn't say drop, there was a change that, that, um, that occurred in, that corresponded to the change that occurred in the consensus conference. In other words, a number of people, a significant number of people for three out of four issues were willing to outsource their belief to the consensus conference. Remember, they're not learning anything new about the issue. All they're learning is what the attitudes of consensus conference attendees was. So you might ask, how does this compare to learning what experts think, right? And this is an important question because we know that there are some concerns about 
um, people's willingness to trust experts. Uh, here's some very recent data, well, the most recent data I could find from uh, Pew. And you can see that only 38% of US adults trust scientists a lot. Um, and 21% say they don't trust them much or at all. Now, of course, this differs a lot between Democrats and Republicans, um, but nevertheless, there is a surprising lack of trust in experts. It depends on the expert. Um, people tend to trust their local doctor. Uh, they tend not to trust economists. I'm not sure they're wrong about that. Uh, in any case, what we did was compare people's willingness to trust experts to their willingness to trust people at a consensus conference. Um, so this study was a between subject design now where we have a group where we just get their attitude and then a group where we tell them the results of the consensus conference and a third group that is told um, what experts believe. Actually, we made up what experts believe. So what they're told is the same, is that experts believe the same thing that the consensus conference participants believed um, after the consensus conference. And what you can see is that for this first issue, the baby bonds issue, uh, the learning what experts thought had no effect on people, whereas learning what members of the consensus conference thought did have an effect. For the foreign aid issue, um, learning about both had an effect. For the minimum wage issue, again, learning only about um, the consensus conference made a difference. And then for immigration, nothing made a difference. So for three out of four issues, discovering what your fellow citizens thought after deliberation made a difference, whereas for only one, one, yes, one out of uh, four issues, learning what experts thought made a difference. So in conclusion, don't rely on the deficit model, right? What people know and understand uh, is not always or necessarily what determines their opinion. We have to consider people's perceived understanding as grounded in a community's narrative. Um, this is important because I do think narratives are something that are human specific. In fact, my grad student, Baba Kematian, did his dissertation showing that even the most advanced machine learning tools like GPT-3 um, cannot generate the kind of causal structure that you find in narratives the way humans generate causal structure. Second, don't rely on the cultural consensus model alone either because people need a sense of understanding uh, to come to an opinion, even if they don't need actual understanding. Third, uh, we tend to outsource our beliefs and our reasoning. Um, and so, you know, if we want to convince people of the scientific view, we have to appreciate that they have a completely different narrative than we do. And they're unlikely, therefore, to buy into a scientific consensus. Um, and finally, we can deploy people's tendency to outsource to bring evidence to bear on policy. And that's it. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much um, for a, a great talk. Um, I see we do have some questions from Jan, for example. Yes, I, um, I really like the talk and I, I agree with the conclusions. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, these are minor issues. Uh, I was wondering whether the fact that um, political ideology was the best predictor uh, can be due in part uh, by the fact that this is a well-formed variable, it's dichotomous, uh, it's balanced, it kind of lends itself to linear relationships. Um, and then someone here said, Jenna said, uh, what would uh, happen if we have a variable like religious affiliation that has uh, you know, multiple levels? And um, I'm just looking to see, I actually 
have the variables we looked at here, and I'm trying to remember whether we looked at religious affiliation, um, and we did not. So I don't know. I can, I can show you the variables we looked at. Uh, let me share again. So here are the results of the study. Um, so we looked at political, political ideology, age, um, whether or not people were African-American, Latino, whether they worked with patients, gender. Um, political ideology, actually, I don't think it was measured as a binary variable. I think it was measured along the uh, you know, one to seven conservative to liberal um, scale. Um, and we do have some other binary variables which were not so predictive. Um, you can see that their knowledge of COVID actually, which, which is not binary either, um, was, this, was the most predictive in this particular example for preventive behaviors, um, but not for policy support or risk perception. So yeah, I mean, the, the scale issues are clearly relevant and we probably could have done a better job of, um, of analyzing them. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for showing this, it's really interesting. Sure. Great. Um, so I think we might be able to migrate directly to the open discussion. Um, and I had a question that was sort of inspired by Deborah's talk, but I'm going to shoehorn Stephen's talk into it too, because I think, I think it kind of fits. And if I understand the basic dynamic of at least the harvester ants, then there is a sort of a, a built-in positive feedback uh, effect so that I, as an individual ant, am more likely to go out if there's a lot of other ants that are coming in. But then once I'm going out, I'm going to be one of those other ants that's coming back in. And so um, in the context of like what I consider to be drift diffusion models, that would count as a positive OU process. Um, and when I talk to like neuroscientists, they think that that's kind of crazy to have an OU process that, you know, and basically if you're accumulating information, then how quickly you accumulate information to one of the choices is dependent upon where the accumulator currently is. That's what an, a positive OU process would be. Um, and the, a lot of the neuroscientists I talk to say, why would you ever want that? If you're talking about like an optimal decision maker, then you don't want to bias your accumulation compared to where you already are, because that will give rise to you know, confirmation bias kinds of effects. Um, and I think, so I'm going to say there's also a sense in which what Stephen was talking about is also a positive OU process in that like I don't uh, understand the information myself, but to some degree I'm going to um, defer to my peers. And so, and you get, you know, the, the informational cascades that Bixen um, Hani has talked about, for example. And so I, I, I'm guessing I'm wondering about like the optimality of this, like why humans continue on if they, if they really do have this OU process. Or more generally, I guess I'm wondering, what is it about the interaction between the environment and the individual that would either make the individuals use a a non-negative OU process versus just do what like the neuroscientists often say and just say it's a negative, it's a zero. So that's a question for me, right? Not, oh, not well, I think it's both. Well, Deborah's uh, just tell me what an OU process is. So OU processes, you've got this like accumulator or uh, decision bound model. Yeah. And in the basic, models that you know you get from Roger Ratcliffe, et cetera, um, you have a drift rate. And the drift rate doesn't depend upon where you're currently are. So you start off at the, the middle point, for example, and you're accumulating your evidence, your drift rate is the same regardless of where you are. 
Okay. And they think that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> but there's also going to be times like with, I think, the harvester ants, where the rate with which you accumulate evidence to deciding whether to go or not depends upon where your current position in the accumulation is. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I have some thoughts about that. If, it, if it's not a question for Stephen, um, I think people who are thinking that's not optimal are thinking of the um, decision process as um, independent of the uh, process they're trying to find out about. So it sounds like this objection is about getting swayed by the positive feedback into thinking something that's not true. But the, the, a system like that is useful because it, um, for the ants, because it links what the ants do to food availability without the ants having to know anything. So it's a way to measure rate without counting anything. If, if it just accumulates and there's a decay, so it's called excitable dynamics. If it, if it accumulates and there's a decay, then, then, it then the system registers rate without anybody having to count anything. And so that's useful for the ants because um, it, it actually corresponds to the reality that the more ants are coming back with seeds, the more food there is out there. It's the correct thing to do. And so I'd suggest with people that even though um, people are often wrong, there is some basic idea that if everybody, if more other people think it, then it might be true. Yeah. And that's why, you know, people follow mobs. And when somebody's on the street looking up, everybody looks up and so on. It's just some um, basic idea that, if you think what the people around you think, you're more likely to be right. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. I mean, there, <laughs> it, it sounds like, you know, the Bayesian distinction between case data and class data is relevant here. And, you know, there are different kinds of information that we should use in order to make any decision. Uh, and uh, ignoring background information and focusing only on information that's coming at you at the moment is going to neglect all kinds of probabilistically relevant information in pretty much every case. Great. Um, so um, I'd like to uh, open things up to um, other people. <laughs> I, I can continue um, the thoughts if, if not. Celia's hand is raised. Oh, okay, yeah. Thank you, and, and apologies that I can't do video from where I am. Um, this is not gonna be a well-formed question, but um, essentially Deborah's ants really, really are deferring to their peers. They are absolutely, they seem to be showing blind faith in the information which they get from the returning foragers. Um, I wonder how much Stephen of kind of deferring to peers or learning to others or adopting the beliefs of others is going on in the fascinating experiments that you've told us about. I mean, there's this delicious stuff on contagious sense of understanding. Um, that's, you know, a sense of understanding. That's not actually adopting beliefs from somebody else because you take them to be a decent authority. Um, the uh, changes in the MTurk study, the, the last set of studies you told us about, certainly does seem to be, you know, accepting what has been decided at the consensus conferences as a source of information. But the first set of studies that you told us about, the um, attitudes towards COVID preventative behaviors and so on being um, determined by political affiliation, um, is there a possibility that in that case, the kind of going with the crowd represents um, a kind of a, a, a weak be belief revision process um, rather than 
Uh, now, now this is this is the the most unformed part of it. I'm wondering whether the people who do not accept a scientific consensus are those same people disinclined to accept feedback in a straightforward experiment in which they make a decision, they express their confidence in that decision, they're then given feedback on the accuracy of that response, and now they have another trial, and they're relatively insensitive, their confidence judgments are relatively insensitive to how they did on the primary task. Could this be a more global kind of belief updating uh, yeah. problem or variable? That's a really uh, interesting hypothesis. Um, and I don't know of any data that speaks to it. Maybe somebody in the audience does. Um, it seems to me that um, that kind of explanation is likely to be insufficient though, because uh, the people who understand the least and are the most opposed to the scientific consensus um, certainly have strong beliefs, right? It's, it's not as if they're immune to feedback. They're actually very sensitive to the feedback from their peers, right? Like in the same sense that people, you know, in, in red states feel very strongly that uh, COVID is not something to be scared of and that there um, has been a gross overreaction uh, from blue states. So I don't know of any, it, it seems like, if I understand what you're saying, it seems like you're suggesting that uh, people who don't go with the scientific consensus um, are, are gonna take longer to learn. They're not, they have like a lower learning parameter or something. Um, but I don't know of any evidence to support that. No, I, I think you're, you're right. I didn't make clear. I'm not saying that they're slow to learn, but that their confidence judgments may be relatively insensitive to feedback about their performance. So in a way, it's a kind of a, uh, a, an impairment mm. in I development see. of metacognitive sensitivity. It's like they're less sensitive to evidence. Is that what you're suggesting? Evidence bearing on their own accuracy. It's meta, I think. Mm -hmm. It's um, so, you know, if, if this was a motor learning task, I think they'd be absolutely fine. Right. Um, it may be that if it was an unmonitored right. um, belief development task, that right. they would show, you know, sensitivity to evidence. Right. But if they're asked about their beliefs and they're asked in any way to express confidence about those beliefs, mm -hmm. then they may be insensitive to feedback, influencing their confidence judgments. Yeah. Um, like ants. You, that's, that's a great um, research agenda that you've just articulated. Uh, I don't know what the answer is. The one piece of evidence I think that's consistent with what you're suggesting is that it turns out that um, conservatives are more driven by sacred values, uh, at least on the kinds of issues I was talking about than liberals are. Um, in other words, um, conservatives take a position that is less sensitive to evidence than, than liberals do um, on these particular issues. Uh, and, and so I, I think that would perhaps imply what you're saying. Deborah, did you want to say something? Well, I'm just saying that um, uh, ants don't have any process for matching um, their general ideas to the environment because they don't have general ideas. So they only have um, how their decision impacts whatever happens next. Um, but um, you could make some analogy between that and people who are making decisions without, um, without much uh, feedback from evidence. Um, 
I mean, the the analogies with ants are never going to be very close because um, ants don't have have beliefs. Um, but uh, the a question I have about about your talk is how is the response of people related to what they think um, the experts do to get their information? Um, or in the consensus conference, what people think a deliberative discussion is. That is, I think my um, faith in experts is related to my assessment of what the experts did to know more about it than I do. And um, I, I'm not sure what this um, deliberative discussion, how that would work, but I do have some sense that people through talking to each other could teach each other things. Yeah. Um, but but is there something about the, the process that leads experts to know things that yeah. is is missing? Look, I, I, I agree with you, and I suspect most of our listeners agree that there's something about the adversarial process in science that's special, right? The peer review is terribly important, um, that replicability is terribly important, and, and, and understanding these things is critical to coming to good judgments. But, you know, if you look at the conspiracy theory literature, for instance, um, it turns out that people who believe the oddest things um, believe that their beliefs are based on solid evidence. So they have a different view often of what solid evidence is. Right, right. So that's part of the narrative that, that is uh, that, that drives their community. I see. The narrative about how you know things. That's part of the narrative. That's right. Yeah, yeah that's I right. see. How to deal with evidence. Yeah. So that's a, a layer that's missing for ants entirely, right? So we can see from ants how um, interactions and collective behavior might drive them to make my, you know, the process that generates decisions, that generates collective outcomes out of interactions without any um, narrative at all. Yeah, no, I definitely think we're talking, I'm, I'm talking about something that's uniquely human is, is my I think so too. <laughs> Someone has their hand up, yeah. Jeff. Yeah. Uh, so this question is primarily for Deborah, kind of um, building on what Celia was asking you about. As I think about the harvester and turtle ants, they each have different models. And I'm wondering what you kind of think the meta model is. So in other words, like where does it, you know, it, obviously it's not that they're, they're kind of doing control theory consciously. This has this has evolved over time. But what are the you know what are the kind of building blocks that allow for these very sophisticated operations to happen and be very different across different ant species? Well, the building blocks are simple uh, responses to to interactions and and the the feedback that they generate. Um, and so it's not like um, that came out of nowhere. Um, every organism is using that in the same way in interactions among cells. I mean, that's pretty fundamental to life that different entities bump into each other and there's some simple response and in the aggregate, it makes some outcome. Um, but with the ants, it has to be very simple. They don't know where they are or how much food there is or how much food they need or anything. So it always has to be built out of um, the aggregate of very simple interactions. Is, is that your question? Yeah, that's kind of what I'm getting at is what's that kind of fundamental thing that allows for this very, very, very behavior across species? Yeah, well, you know, uh, the, the cells in uh, the eukaryotic cells, so the cell in all multicellular organisms um, came about through um, over a long evolutionary time by different bacteria getting together. I mean, it's it's very fundamental to life that different things get together and in some simple way um, create a system that works. Um, so it's not just the ants doing it, it's everything alive is doing it. So the ants didn't make it up, right? 
the ants just uh, um, allow us to see the ants as separate individuals that are interacting. But that um, very simple interactions can have a collective outcome is something we would see it in anything if we were able to track it. Thanks. Thanks. So uh, that I know that doesn't answer your question, but but it, but I just want to say it's not special to ants that simple interactions make um, uh, complicated outcomes that adjust to changing environments. It's just that it, ants are a good way to see something that happens everywhere. Right. Great. I guess I'm next. Uh, thank you very much for really fascinating talks. Uh, and I have a question to both of you. So basically, I want you to maybe speculate on whether what do you think uh, the rich information flow in a group does for the adaptability of the, uh, of the group as a whole to potential changes in the environment? So does relying on the peers more in a group make the group, uh, the ant colony or a human group potentially more adaptable to, uh, I don't know, climate change or in human case to a pandemic to being more adaptive to sudden changes in the environment? Should I jump in, Deborah? Do you want to go first? Yeah. No, you go first. Um, well, I think it's a double-edged sword, Marina. I mean, right. So on one hand, you know, humans may have made it to the moon by virtue of collective action, right? I mean, think about the thousands and thousands of people that were necessary in order to get to the moon or to build laptops or to do any of the amazing things that humans have done. So if we're going to solve climate change, it's going to be a collective effort and it's going to require deep and shared understanding, right? So yes, that's the positive view. The negative view is that exactly the same processes lead to crazy ideology. So, you know, I think that, that Putin is driving Russia using exactly those same collective a, a, a narrative that depends on knowledge and action for by many, many people, right? That a narrative that unifies them and, and, and makes up a goal um, and puts that goal into operation, right? Allows implementation. So it sort of all depends on what we do with it, right? The, the skills, the, the, the abilities, that humans have for collective thought and collective action can be um, a tool for good and they can be a tool for horrible things. I think it, it goes back to uh, what Stephen was talking about that it really matters how the information is linked to the outside and what is actually happening. That is, if you have a rapid flow of information, but the information is false, it doesn't do much good. So it's not just the, the rate or the organization of the flow of information, but the link between the information and the relevant features of the world that matter for what you're trying to do. That is, if you have rapid flow of information that climate change doesn't exist, it, it doesn't really help, right? So um, it's not just how the information moves around, but how the information is related to the, the outside um, world. So in the human case, there's never a sufficient amount of information to completely constrain our beliefs, right? Um, we have to use other principles like coherence or the ridiculousness of alternative explanations. There are other things we have to appeal to in order to determine what's right. Um, like there could be some conspiracy that's generating all these ideas we have about climate change. Seems unlikely given the temperature outside today, but it's possible, right? Um, so we have to rule those things out based on other notions, I think, beyond information that's coming from the world. I, I don't know whether your ants have to do that too, or whether their world is simple enough that there's enough information to guide them. Well, it's not that their world is any simpler, but that the, they only can respond to the things that they are detecting. So... Um, the world isn't simpler, but their relation to it is maybe more limited because they can only 
know about, I mean, they can only react to what they are perceiving. Much better way to say. So in light of the time, let's have one last question from Jan because it has been seconded from somebody else. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I'm puzzled by this idea of um, ants not having central control uh, and relying only on uh, local interactions. Um, and I'm puzzled because um, I know little about ants, but I know enough to see that they have hierarchies, they have uh, role differentiation, they may have even uh, distant communication. Um, and all these, to me, uh, get close enough to the idea of central control. How? Thoughts? Oh, sorry. Is yeah, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah well, um, they do the role differentiation without central control. Um, again, using um, rates of interaction among ants. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by hierarchy. Uh, well, there's a queen. Well, the queen isn't in charge. She doesn't tell anybody what to do. She just lays the eggs. So actually, she the queen was named the queen by a, a 16th century English writer who was trying to use bees as an example of uh, why they should support the monarchy. But um, it's not really a very good name because she has no political power. She's sort of the ovaries of the colony. She lays the eggs. Um, so uh, there isn't really a hierarchy. Um, and to me, that's what's interesting about the system that it does work without any central control. So nobody tells anybody else what to do. Well, not in, a, in the human sense, but um, I don't know if this is true for ants, but for bees, for example, uh, there is some kind of chemical uh, substance that holds a colony together. Um, it is not true for, for ants. So I don't think that's true. I don't, well, I don't know what you mean by holds the colony together. What, what defines a colony? Uh, you mean how do we define a colony? Or how do they know they're in the colony? Right. How do they know they're in the colony? Yes. How, so, how do they stay together? You mean, well, actually, bees aren't, honeybees aren't very good at staying together. And they will, although there are different odors for different colonies, bees will, honeybees will readily go into another colony and be accepted. But in, um, and that's part of what we've bred them to do. But in ants, um, uh, ants of different colonies smell different. So they recognize ants of another colony by the smell. But that, that's not exactly the same thing as holding them together. That's the local interaction that distinguishes when ants meet, whether they're nest mates or not. And then they react in different ways. Um, and you know, it's generally true, I think, in most ant species that if an ant from one colony goes into the nest of another, it will be thrown out. Um, so, oh, but it isn't like it isn't like the chemical is sort of telling them all day you belong to this colony. So, so I, I guess really I don't know what you mean by holding it together. What what what? How are you thinking about that? Well, it's obviously uh, different. We're using different languages, uh, and it's definitely uh, we're talking about different levels of organization. But in humans, we can. Um, see these uh, things like central control, um, hierarchies, role differentiations as emergent properties. Um, it's, it's just a different level of complexity. So, you know, telling someone Does what to do. Emergent mean not, not central control? Well, or central control, but emerging from local properties, from, from uh, local interactions. Right is 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 not something that is pre-designed. It's it's something that emerges emerges through evolution. And you know, 
ants are not there yet, but the the complexity has evolved up to us, up to humans. So I think, you know, again, I'm not quite sure what you mean, but, um, uh, you know, I work for a university. We're organized into departments. There's a department chair. Uh, the chairs report to the deans and so on. So there's a, um, a, a hierarchy there. Um, it's not really like the de that the dean controls everything, but the dean does tell the chairs what to do. And in some ways, the chairs tell us what to do and so on. So I wouldn't say that's emergent. I would say that's explicit um, organization with some kind of central control. Um, in ants, there isn't anything like that. There isn't anybody who tells anybody else what to do. Uh, so emergent or not, um, the, the, there aren't certain individuals with positions of more authority than others. Yeah, but I guess I just wanted to suggest that this is a kind of continuous process and we can see kind of traces of of that uh, at the ants level, but I might be wrong. Yeah, I, I don't know. Well, I'd be interested to hear more about what you, how you're thinking about it. Sure, thank you. Okay, great. So um, we are over time now. Uh, so I wanna thank again, both of these great speakers for great presentations and uh, advertise next week's talks, which are going to be Filippo Menser and Ulrika Hahn. So hope to see you then. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.